This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome once again from Johannesburg here in South Africa. My name, of course, Evan Janssen. This show is always live, broadcast from our studios here in Auckland Park. We are also streaming live on YouTube right now with the whole show available on demand on our YouTube channel. Today is Rwandan Genocide Remembrance Day, 21 years ago exactly. That one of the great tragedies of recent times took place on the African continent. Well, we look to pick up the Dacha debate again after part Parliament's Portfolio Committee on Health ordered a fresh round of roundtable discussions on the legalization of cannabis. Alcohol abuse continues to decimate our communities. We'll talk about that later. We will also look at traffic after the Easter weekend peak. And we close today with a play called Broken Boys. But first, let's get the day's news from an Indo mouth. Good morning, I'm Anindo Mal. Let's just have a look at the stories making headlines today. The Free State Stars and Football Fraternity have been shocked by the death of national striker Richard Henyekane. The club for confirmed the former Mamelodi Sundowns and Bafana player passed away in the early hours of this morning. Henyekane was involved in a serious car accident while travelling with four other passengers. Only he lost his life. State Security Minister David Mahrobo has called on all communities to be vigilant about possible Islamic State recruitments. The 15-year-old girl is now back with her parents after a failed attempt to join the Islamic group ISIS. After an attempt to board a plane for Saudi Arabia, the girl was taken off a British Airways flight in Cape Town. They are trying to recruit people without putting their foot in the country. And this uh, space, which is uh, the cyberspace and social platforms, they are trying to radicalize our young people. And we have a responsibility as a state to be very vigilant to notice what's happening there in that space. Port Elizabeth is the latest city to see the defacing of a colonial symbol. Last night, a statue depicting the bravery of animals in the anglo Boer War, deemed colonial by the EFF, was damaged. Meanwhile, the city of Tuane has tightened security at all historical structures. It is also laid a charge of damage to property after the Paul Kruger statue in Pretoria was defaced with paint on Sunday. And George Lucas' attorney is fighting to have him released from jail. This, as it's been reported, Luca needs special medical attention after being diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. Lawyers of the murder accused will reportedly be approaching the courts if Luca can't spend his last days with his family. Luca is accused of killing Teaser's boss, Lolly Jackson, in 2010. And preliminary figures from uh, uh, four provinces indicate that at least 140 people were killed on the country's roads over the Easter break. Last Easter, 100 and, uh, 193 people lost their lives on the road. Remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just search for Newsroom. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Janine. Uh, today, we commemorate the 21st anniversary of the Rwanda Genocide Remembrance Day, a dark time for the continent and a nation whose people were torn apart by propaganda and driven to hatred. Today is remembered for the brutal attacks between the Hutus and the Tutsis that lasted around 100 days, leaving at least a million people dead. Now, joining us in studio today is a Rwanda genocide survivor and a representative from the Holocaust and Genocide Center, Bonaventure Kagaruka. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. A dark day for the African continent, for us all as Africans. Can you just briefly take us back to what was happening in Rwanda just before or in the time leading up to the genocide? Well, Rwanda used to be a beautiful country by 1994, um, let's say around this day. Rwanda turned into a hell. A brother was no longer a brother. Uh, I don't really have words uh, I should use to explain to you um, what happened in that very morning on the 7th of April. So people, they started killing. Um, in 100 days, um, as, as you know, 
um, almost a million of people were selected, were butchered, they were wiped out. Tell us your story, uh, how you managed to escape the persecution of that time and, and then the long journey that's led you to South Africa to where you are today. Uh, it wasn't really a persecution. Uh, it was um, mass murdering people. Uh, in the same night on the 6th day opera, when the airplane was shot down, that's actually when everything started. Uh, we were divided as, as a nation. Uh, there was, was no person to trust. And um, uh, let's say the, the day we, we had been dreading for many years intruded. Now, the International Criminal Tribunal began in, in 1994. Do, do you think that all the time that it took for this tribunal to, uh, to get to some sort of findings, uh, has it delivered the justice and the, the closure, one would think, that the people in your country would have wanted? Uh, definitely, as a genocide survivor, um, in my personal view, um, I would say the step which has been done uh, is, is little. We need to do more. The genocide perpetrators are still at large um, all over the world, including South Africa. So um, we still need um, justice to take its cause. How, how do you think that justice would be able to be served going forward? Uh, for me, the important thing is now um, educating communities about uh, human rights, tolerance, how we can live together as a uh, human race. Uh, that's very, very important for me, uh, education. We see the kinds of, in the video that, that we have playing now, in the end it comes down to tribalism tribal differences. It's, it's not a unique scenario to Rwanda. Tribalism is, is something that threatens and affects the entire African continent. How do we as Africans come to terms with tribal differences? And, and how did you guys in Rwanda come to terms with it? Yes, I wouldn't say we've come to terms with it. Uh, it's just a long way. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we, we can cohabitate. Um, a true reconciliation takes time. Uh, I believe we still need to work hard towards a full reconciliation. Uh, in terms of the uh, African, African continent, yeah. um, it seems we haven't learned uh, from the past, so, uh, which means also our future. Uh, doesn't look bright. What about South Africa? You've now come to this country. Yes. Uh, you live here, and, and, and you, must have, you must have experienced some of the, what is called, xenophobic attacks here in South Africa. Uh, if we had 100 days mm -hmm. of these kinds of unabated xenophobic attacks in South Africa, do you think we could, we could uh, experience something like you guys did in, in, in Rwanda? They, they, it, is, it all starts as a hatred, and then it turned to be into a genocide. Uh, xenophobia, racism, uh, sexism, that, that, that's the way it starts start from. Uh, I believe um, in, in, in South Africa the, and the, our spirit of Ubuntu and uh, the history of South Africa, especially apartheid, uh, you know, xenophobia shouldn't be happening in this country. We, we are all human beings. We, we need to learn to be more human and, uh, and live together. The current situation back in Rwanda, what's the relationship today between the Hutus and the Tutsi populations there? Are they able now to live in harmony? And, and, and we always ask forgiveness or, or ask people to give forgiveness. How are you dealing with, with that? I should say... Uh, People, they, they are living peacefully. Uh, but on the other hand, it's no time to dance with angels. Uh, 
21 years ago, the wounds are, are still fresh, memories are still alive. Um, I believe we need a, a collective effort as all Rwandans to, to, to make this happen. And we should not take it as granted. We still have a long way to go. Let's get back to tribalism. We, we see the tribal threats throughout the continent. We, we, see it, we saw it now with the Nigerian election. Uh, uh, trial, tribalism, religion uh, are real threats to the safety of our communities and to peace. Definitely they are. Um, I, I link um, personal uh, tribalism to ignorance because we, we are the same human race we are, or human beings. Also, there are uh, bad political motivations behind, behind tribalism. It's propaganda. It's, it's, propaganda. Is it the, the rise of leaders who push these kind of yes. agendas? We see now in South Africa the rise of revolutionary parties who, who tell the populace whatever they want to, to hear, who jump on the bandwagon. Uh, are, are these kinds of revolutionaries a threat in the same vein that we see? That's, it's not a revolution. Uh, if I can tell you in Rwanda that's what happened. It is a revolution. Uh, that could be a fiasco. Um, you cannot um, uh, initiate a revolution by killing part of a population or calling upon people to kill each other. Uh, to me, that uh, it is not a revolution at all. Well, I thank you for joining us and sharing this very difficult experience that you've had. You guys are doing fantastic work uh, with the programs that you are involved with now. Thank you uh, mm -hmm. for joining us today. That's a Rwanda genocide survivor, uh, Bonaventure Gagaruka, who works at the Holocaust and Genocide Center here in Johannesburg. Thank you once again. Yes. It's not a revolution if you have to kill people en masse, if you have to threaten others, if you have to strengthen the tribal divides between people who ultimately are of the same race on the same continent. Think about that. Let's just take a look at your tweets. These are some of your views. Ochieng Otieno says, sadly, every year we're going to have memorial mass for innocent souls, starting from Westgate and Begatoni and now Harissa. So heartbreaking. Yes, it, it's at the heart of, there's no revolution where you have to kill innocent people. Alfredo Zamudio says, hashtag Harissa. Kenya, 148 students executed while at school. When are world leaders arriving to the memorial service? Very good question, Alfredo. When they killed 12 in Paris, the world leaders were marching in the streets of that city. Mohammed Osman says, the government has failed us in Westgate, in Arissa University, and it will fail us in future, says Mohammed, speaking about Kenya. Mark Bowden talks about, remind me why anyone is supposed to tolerate Islam. Why, Mark? Because... At the heart of it, Islam is a religion just like Christianity that preaches tolerance and respect. Unfortunately, how people interpret that religion is a, a whole different story. There you have pictures uh, from R. Rai Wyatt. No difference from Harissa Unisij massacre, except they were forced to convert to Islam and they aren't dead yet. Hashtag Kenya. How can you, how can you blame an entire religion? for the deeds of a few radicals within that. Imagine we did that within Christianity, we did that within Buddhism. The whole, the whole world would be at war. Now for our tweet of the day. This one comes from Offense, uh, 2012 that is. Uh, 2012 and 2015 are the years we were, we, were, we were lost heroes and icons, yet we lost another one, talking about Richard Henyekani. Uh, that one from Offensive. Yes, Offensive today. The Free State, Bloemfontein, Free State stars are a very sad place because, well, another great footballer is lost in a tragic car accident over the Easter weekend. We'll talk about road carnage a little bit later in our show after the Easter weekend. But let's now take a look at what's happening elsewhere. Uh, our, elsewhere in the world, in China, the South uh, China Morning Post says at least 14 people were injured with six in a stable condition in hospital after the explosions at a chemical factory in southern China on Monday evening. 
The move to Europe, the Times there reports that the teenage brother of Britain's youngest convicted terrorist is thought to have fled to Syria in an attempt to reach Islamic State fighters. And then in New York, the International New York Times. Hundreds gathered outside the Chiromo funeral home in Morgue, where the bodies of their loved ones had been brought following the attack that left 148 now dead in Kharissa University last week, Thursday. Now let's take a look at what is happening around our country today. We start here in Johannesburg, where the five men arrested in connection with the recent murder of two policemen on a Gauteng highway will appear in separate courts today. The suspects were apprehended in Gauteng and Durban. Then in Bloemfontein, where triple murder accused farmer Johan Sonnenberg will appear at the Hatzoffel Magistrates Court for a bail application today. Sonnenberg and his wife, Elena, were arrested after the bodies of three men who went missing in February were discovered on their farm. And in KwaZulu Natal, a 19 year old man who led police to the body of a teenager that he allegedly murdered, claiming the devil made him kill him, is expected to appear in the Pine, Pine Town Magistrates Court. That is a little bit later today. Time for us to take a short break. You are watching Newsroom here on SABC News. This week we are taking you around the continent, telling you stories about what makes Africa, Africa. We now head to the Kenyan coast, where we meet a man using needles to fight a growing drug culture. A recent study revealed that there are 850 drug addicts in Diani alone, with over 220 using injectable drugs such as heroin. In my community, I've seen a lot of these people suffer. The Journal, every Saturday at half past one on SABC News. Welcome back. You're still with Newsroom. Now this week, a two-day session looking at the medical and recreational use of cannabis will be held by the Department of Social Development and the Central Drug Authority here in South Africa with the hashtag Dacha debate that we started here at Newsroom. We've spoken extensively about this topic. We've also spoken to all relevant stakeholders about legalizing cannabis in South Africa on this very show, and we'll continue to do so now as we pick up the baton in the next couple of weeks. So, to give us the latest around the Dacha debate, we are joined from Durban by the spokesperson of the South African Cannabis Working Group, Mr. Andre Duplessis. Very good morning to you, uh, Mr. Duplessis. I thank you once again for joining us. Morning, Evan. Thanks for having me. Andre, just tell us where we are now. It's, it sounds like a, uh, uh, like, a, like a real development, having a roundtable discussion on the use of cannabis in the country. It's a recent development now. Tell us, why is it so important to have this discussion right now, and what does this mean for the legalization of cannabis? Yevon, it's important to have this discussion for a start because the, as with cannabis control or regulation, there would be many government departments and spheres of government that would be involved in regulating and controlling cannabis. And naturally these different spheres of government would have to speak with each other and have these roundtables to discuss the way forward. Now the Portfolio Committee on Health mandated that the Medical Research Council, the Medical Control Council and the Central Drug Authority have these discussions to plot a path forward so that we can figure a way to join the change that's happening internationally. There's real change happening internationally. Uh, uh, more and more states in America, they seem to uh, be legalizing cannabis use, recreational and both uh, medicinal use. But tell us about what's this debate here in South Africa doing. We now see 
uh, the MCC, the, the Central Drug Authority, the Medical Research Council, everyone chipping into this debate. Uh, are we finally seeing some alignment that we all have to come together to take this forward? Okay. Um, even yes, it's actually quite encouraging to see government working with the stakeholders and people who are interested in affected parties with regard to cannabis in taking this roundtable forward. Um, as you noted, in America there's many states that are legalizing the adult use of cannabis and regulating and controlling that market as opposed to leaving it illegal. And these are countries that are signatories to the same international treaties that South Africa is. So you can see that there are limits of latitude that are allowed within the single convention treaty that allows for regional control of certain drugs. You can't really expect one single um, central body like the United Nations to control a field of cannabis in the outskirts of KwaZulu-Natal. So that kind of control has to be given to a regional and local level and these are the things that we need to discuss along with the fact that we no longer sit and wait for government to give us the information about cannabis. If you were to just use Google or Bing or Twitter, you can inform yourself about cannabis and actually come up with a much more clear and concise opinion than the information available on government websites. Now let's just talk about the bills that have been drafted on legalizing cannabis here in South Africa. If I'm correct, there are two of them. Where are they now in this process? Well, it was in fact the Portfolio Committee hearing on health that was discussing the Medical Innovation Bill. Now the Medical Innovation Bill, I personally believe, is the worst cannabis bill on any Parliament's table on the planet because of its poor descriptions relating to cannabis and its definitions. Um, that bill has been put on hold, thankfully, by the Portfolio Committee because there is the route that patients can take via the Medical Control Council of applying for a Section 21 application to get cannabis medicine for whatever ailment or disease that they might be treating. Now the Portfolio Committee has insisted that the Medical Control Council make this more available for patients and that's encouraging that they do that. So the only bill at the moment really that's worth speaking about, I'm afraid to say, would be the one that we've proposed which is the Cannabis Control Bill and as yet what we're going to propose it at this round table, mm. it is based on international best practices and I discussed it here in the newsroom once before. Now let's just talk about this, this overwhelming interest from the public. Uh, have the public really been able to give their sort of input in these bills and, 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 and what has the response been? With the Medical Innovation Bill they did a call for public input but between versions 1 and version 11 it didn't seem as if any input was actually afforded any of the South African citizens, so I'm not too sure about that. With our Cannabis Control Bill, we had over 250 people um, contribute to the working of it, including some international experts from the UK and the US that have been involved in bills in their respective countries. So we, our bill is based on international best practice and it's a sound, practical, bill for South Africa. Now Andre, this week there is now a bit of movement with the roundtable discussions that's happening this week. Where can the public get involved with these roundtable discussions and, and who do you, other than yourself and the Cannabis Working Group, who else will be involved in these roundtable discussions here in Johannesburg on Friday? I haven't been given a list of the delegates that will be attending these roundtable discussions but I'm assuming that it will be key government departments like the CDA, MCC, MRC, Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, Forestries and Fisheries and I'm sure SAPS will be there too. Um, as for the public getting hold of um, people and perhaps contributing, I would suggest that they get hold of the Central Drug Authority. 
They, their contact details are on the Department of Social Development's website and they should get a hold of them and put their name forward and express their interest in contributing. Well, um, there's, you know, as, as I said, Eben, these roundtables have got to discuss the various things regarding cannabis, the harms, the, the practicality, the pragmatic approaches to whether it's controllable or not. And your next article, which is coming up about alcohol, um, it's, they have to be weighed in comparison to the social harms in society. Now, with regard to alcohol, for example, in the Western Cape, the most measurable statistic of a substance being abused is measured in the babies born with fetal alcohol syndrome. Yeah. Now, the Western Cape has the highest incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome, yet the female mayor and female premier of that province don't address this incidence of substance abuse recorded in infant births. And in their anti-substance abuse campaigns, they don't even talk about that, yet they talk about all other substances, including cannabis, as being a problem. Yeah. And they, they miss the most very obvious one. Which is alcohol. Which is Andre, alcohol. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us today. We'll continue with this discussion throughout the rest of the week. And thank you for setting up our very next story. That's from the Cannabis uh, Working Group, Andre Duplessis, live from Durban. We'll try and have him in studio a little bit later in the week when they come to Johannesburg for that discussion. We were talking about, well, the damage caused by alcohol compared to the damage caused by cannabis. These are one of the discussions that's on the table this week. We asked the question, is South Africa losing the fight against alcohol? South Africa has been ranked amongst the top five heaviest drinking nations in the con on the continent. Dangerous drinking patterns, especially by women, cost both local and national government billions of rands each year and puts a strain on the healthcare system. According to a study by the University of Cape Town, the Western Cape has come, has come out tops as the area with the highest incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome-related disabilities globally. HIV and AIDS, violence and road accidents are all linked to alcohol abuse as well. Now, from our studios in Cape Town, we are joined by Sibiwe Warube, who is the spokesperson for the Western Cape Department of Health. A very good morning to you, Sibiwe. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Evan, and good morning to your viewers. Now, you, you must have heard my previous guest from the Cannabis Working Group while you were sitting waiting for the interview. Andre Duplessis accuses the Western Cape government of running anti-drug campaigns, but not seeing alcohol as a drug even in that campaign. How do you view that? I would invite Andre to uh, go on any Western Cape uh, government website just to see what, what we are currently doing with regards to um, combating alcohol abuse. What the, the Western Cape government has decided to do is that alcohol is no longer just uh, a problem for the health department or for the transport department, but it is a big societal um, challenge. And so we've decided to roll out an entire strategy that's going to be transversal, that's going to be including the Department of Health, Department of Transport, Department of Social Development, um, and the Department of Community Safety. And the idea behind this is to tackle alcohol from all fronts. So to tackle alcohol in, in, on, on our roads, which causes a lot of road um, crashes, to tackle alcohol on the health front, which causes a lot of strain on the health system, a lot of strain on our clients who are chronic medication clients, a lot of strain on women who are pregnant um, and who uh, and who, who, who expose children to fetal alcohol syndrome. And so I, I believe that if Andre were to take the time to look at our, at our strategy, he, w he, would, um, he would change his mind. Well, it's a, that's a discussion for us to have a little bit further down the road. But I want to talk about the Western Cape as a case in point. You know, it's famous for the top system, institutionalized drinking, giving people uh, uh, alcohol in, uh, in exchange for a day's labor and so forth. This is the historical context that we have in the Western Cape. But this isn't the leading cause of alcohol abuse in the city, is it? There are other underlying factors. Now, I want to ask you, what has happened 
since all pubs and clubs were forced to close at 2 a.m. in the morning, are people drinking less? Um, what, what the provincial government has tried to do with, the, with this entire study is to look at drinking patterns and what are some of the causes um, of, of abuse. And what we've managed to, to find out is that there are different patches in across the province with massive drinking problems or massive drinking and, and uh, substance abuse problems. So what we've then done is we've tried to zoom in on those areas specifically, um, such as Kayalicha, Nyanga, Manenberg, and we've tried to tailor our strategies according to the needs of that community. So yes, um, we are exploring different ways of trying to um, curb alcohol abuse in the province, but we are not just focusing on one way, which is reviewing legislation. And so so what my point is, is that we are, this whole strategy, this transversal government strategy will allow us to see exactly which are some of the most effective ways of preventing people from, from, from alcohol abuse. Because we've seen, we've seen the, the adverse results. We've seen that it costs not only the, the provincial government 17 billion rand to deal with the effects of alcohol. And this is not even talking about the, the um, human cost. Advertising is cited as one of the scenarios that's going to be uh, reviewed. Are you also reviewing alcohol advertising in the Western Cape? And so we've realized that we, the government cannot do this alone. And it's something that we are, in this strategy looks into. We are inviting um, producers, we're inviting uh, distributors of alcohol to the table to say how is it that we can get into a partnership where we are uh, promoting responsible consumption. Because if this is just merely a, a government effort, we are not going to even scrap the surface. People need to come on board civil society organizations need to come on board, but also distributors of alcohol. So yes, we, those are some of the things that we are looking into, but we are also inviting the private sector to, to talk to us about how we can promote responsible consumption of alcohol, because nobody stands to gain from a society that is ridden with alcohol and substance abuse in any case. The projects that you guys are putting in place to deal with it, just give us a quick update. So the, 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 the game changer specifically, which is the, 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 the identifying alcohol as one of, of the game changers, is like I mentioned before, has allowed us, the research has allowed us to zoom into specific areas to see exactly where the patterns are um, and what are some of the, the challenges. So we've seen that we have about 5,800 legal um, distribution centers or shibins or, or, or pubs in the province. But we have about 24,000 which are illegal. So this is one of our biggest challenges that we have, we, we have illegal establishments that are distributing alcohol, meaning that we cannot actually regulate or, or monitor where the patterns are. So this is our first strategy where we, we want to talk to, to, to distributors about the fact that there are illegal establishments because we believe where we've seen the effect where there are lots of um, illegal establishments, there's lots of abuse and there's lots of interpersonal violence and there's lots of um, um, car crashes. And so the first strategy is looking at mm. responsible production and responsible distribution. The second strategy is looking specifically at young people. We want to talk to young people about having an alternative to alcohol because the problem, uh, we've seen that this is not an economical problem. This is a societal one. This is a, 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 a social problem. And so we want to target young people where we're using these transversal yeah. strategies where we talk to young people about the effects of alcohol, but some of the positive ways in which they can channel their energy, like our youth cafes, like our mod centers, after school centers, mm. and that kind of thing. So I think it's quite important to look at it in a broader sense um, as opposed to just like a health perspective. Sibira, thank you for joining us today to talk about this. Uh, well, it's a scourge that our society suffers from. This is Sibiwe Warube, who's the spokesperson for the Western Cape Department of Health. We're talking about alcohol abuse in society. Yes, South Africa is one of the heaviest drinking nations on the planet, and it plays out on our roads. It plays out throughout our society. 
in the high levels of violence, casual violence, that is, that we have. Now, let's take a look at a picture of the day. The man who also always delivers, Tommy Dixon, Mr. Delivery. This one is from our assignments editor down in uh, Port Elizabeth. There you see a picture of the Anglo Boer Memorial statue that's been broken down in Port Elizabeth. Locals and eyewitnesses suspect EFF members, says the SABC. He says SABC Eastern Cape. Now, I tell you, we will have that discussion tomorrow. The EFF, they have confirmed. We're going to try and get all the relevant stakeholders in this uh, debate. And we will have a heated exchange tomorrow. That we can be sure of. Now, let's take a look at what's happening on our Newsroom Facebook page today. More than 800 Mozambiquians have been arrested and deported after attempting to cross the Lubombo River. Border post uh, that's uh, into South Africa illegally, the Home Affairs Department says... The suspects were arrested during the Easter weekend. Then Boko Haram militants disguised as preachers killed at least 24 people and wounded several others in an attack near a mosque in northeast Nigeria's Borno state. And the United Nations Security Council has condemned crimes committed by armed groups in a camp housing almost 20,000 Palestinian refugees in Syria. All of those stories, a whole lot more, news on Facebook page, also sabc.co.za forward slash news. That's where you get all the updates. All of the time. You're watching Newsroom. Time for us to take a short commercial break. Art is a personal expression that evokes a flame from within. Street art, it's, it's, it's a vast concept. Dancing is one of the main art forms on the streets of Africa. Regardless of how it is done, the streets remain expressive. A passionate artist in the central business district of Johannesburg. Yeah, I've been doing this for, it's been seven years or eight years now. Brains lost control on what to do then. Words dispute in the mouth of a woman. That's Kaleidoscope, Sundays, 5.30 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Let's just have a look at the stories making headlines today. The Free State Stars and Football Fraternity have been shocked by the death of national striker Richard Henyakanye. The club confirmed that the former Mamelodi Sundowns and Bafana player passed away in the early hours of this morning. Henyakane was involved in a serious car accident while travelling with four other passengers. Only his life was lost. State Security Minister David Makhlobo says security officials are working tirelessly to ensure the safety of South Africans, but has called on all communities to be vigilant about possible Islamic State recruitments. A 15-year-old girl is now back with her parents after a failed attempt to join the Islamic group ISIS. After an attempt to board a plane for Saudi Arabia, the girl was taken off a British Airways flight in Cape Town. Port Elizabeth is the latest city to see the defacing of a colonial symbol. Last night, a statue depicting the bravery of animals in the anglo Bureau War, deemed colonial by the EFF, was damaged. Meanwhile, the city of Tuane has tightened security at all historical structures. It has also laid a charge of damage to property after the Paul Kruger statue in Pretoria was defaced with paint on Sunday. Remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just search for Newsroom. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, back to you. Thank you, Annie. Now, preliminary figures indicate that at least 140 people were killed on the country's roads over this Easter weekend. Last year, 193 people lost their lives on the roads. Meanwhile, a new regulation, the National Road Traffic Act, will be introduced from next month in an attempt to try and stem some of the carnage on our roads from the 1st of May. Parents travelling with their toddlers will be allowed, obliged by law to strap them into a car seat. 
Already during the Easter weekend, law enforcement officers cut down on those who didn't put their children's safety as a priority. The aim was to try and reduce the 2015 Easter death toll to beneath the 100 mark. Now, taxi organization Santaka's Bafana Magagula is once again with us in studio to just look back at the weekend. You were here last week, Mr. Magagula. Just give me your, your view of how this, uh, Easter, uh, this Easter weekend went on our roads. Well, um, though traffic is, keeps on increasing, um, I, th I think there is some improvement, though it is not good enough from uh, uh, what we experienced, that we're still having over 100 people killed. Um, we're looking at the situation or we're targeting a situation where um, we, will, we will see a, a not death on, on our road. The attitude of the people needs, needs to change. Now, a little bit earlier we spoke about alcohol abuse in our society in general and then also it plays out on, on our roads. The devastation that it calls on the roads cannot be argued against. Why do people continue to drink and drive in South Africa despite all the campaigns that we have ongoing? Um, though one cannot give a, a real reason why, um, I think we need to continue uh, you know, saying it. Uh, conscientizing people, uh, uh, reviving their consciousness, mm. and law enforcement needs to take its course. Uh, there must be zero tolerance uh, when one is, is found drinking and driving. And when, when that is done, there should be also conviction. And those convictions should be announced so that people can see that uh, this, this is... Uh, and not good for, for, for road user or for one to, to, to take liquor and drive. Now, as the, as the biggest taxi organization in South Africa, are you happy that uh, our taxi drivers are, 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 in general, improving the, the level of service that they give to the clientele here in South Africa? Well, we're very happy to see that our Shokomela program uh, is working and we, we've got a program. Uh, soon the NEC of Santaco will be uh, heavy, having a, a prosperous, a, a strategic plan to put more efforts to improve on, on the Shokomela program uh, because it's, it's, it's our only hope that uh, our drivers, uh, it will assist our drivers to, to highly improve in terms of uh, obeying the rules of the roads and treating their customers accordingly. Basic rules of the road, they are basic things that we all have to adhere to before and after a trip. Uh, do, we, do we do regular pre-trip car inspections? Uh, do, 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 we, do we stop at stop signs? Are we courteous on our roads? Is it improving? Uh, from my observation, there's still a lot of people who turn a stop sign into a yield sign. And uh, from our Shokomela program, uh, there's a lot of improvement if you go to taxi ranks and you check vehicles that leaves our taxi rank. Uh, yes, maybe you will still find some of them that are, uh, are still having defaults after uh, and leaving the taxi rank, but we are improving. We are improving. Now, 446 drivers were arrested for driving without a license over the last week here in South Africa. How do we correct that? How do we deal with that? Um, I, th I, th I think um, local or e e EMPDs must be, must be e e your, your metro police uh, uh, officers should be very, should be very strict uh, before even the, 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 those people move, move out of our cities and go on, na on national roads. And there must also be no... No, t no tolerance in terms of someone who is found driving without a driver's license because that person poses a danger to other road users. Well, Mr. Kmagagula, we can conclude this uh, interview with some sad news. You saw the headline now, uh, you know, we've lost another top sportsman in South Africa to the carnage on the roads. Uh, Chidenya Kani died last night. Uh, he was in a car crash with four others. And it's really affected South Africa. Thank you for joining us today. Um, You're welcome. But it's really affecting uh, the kinds of, well, the, the kind of traffic on social media. Let's have a look at some of your views. What are you, what are you saying with regards to, uh, to this uh, setback for South African football?
Morena Mukutu says, passing four months after the death of his brother, rest in peace. Richard Kimberly Express, Anye Kane. Yes, that is, a, uh, that is a sentiment that's shared pretty much around the country today. Our roads claim yet another soccer player, another son of the soil. This really calls for serious action from road officials. Well, our roads officials are putting in serious action. It is the road users that need to comply. Our road users are not complying. The PSL has lost another soccer player. May he rest in peace. Talking about Richard Inyakani, who died, who died uh, uh, in a in a horrific crash last night. Sexy chubby super mega, super mega says, "What's this I'm hearing of Richard Inyakani Inyakani uh, passing away this morning?" Yes, it is correct. Road accident. Road accident claimed another one of our talented souls. Talented sportsman, great football player. The Kimberley Express. Richard Henyakani is no more with us. Now, to close. Many men live with scars from their past that never heal. And these scars often result in issues that spill over into other areas of life. This Sunday is exactly what a poem for broken boys will explore by looking at the impact silence has brought into the lives of five men. You can see the theater production at the Johannesburg Theater. Uh, yet to tell us more is the writer of a poem for broken boys, Terence French, and Solomon Izanga Shams, who will be hosting uh, the event. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. Good, thank you for having us. Terence, why did you want to? Why did you want to tell the story? Well. Uh the play is a, a lot of my story as well. So it's about uh, guys who have been broken or have brokenness as, as children, which I've seen that so many guys throughout the world have had the same uh, brokenness that I've had, of being sexually abused, losing your parents too early, father's not around. So uh, it was important for me to tell the story so people could uh, voice what's going on with them. Solomon, a, a statistic in South Africa that's quite worrying, and I think one that's at the heart of all the social ills that we that we suffer in, in African households and what we term here in South Africa mixed race or colored households, yeah. the father is present less than 40% of the time. Is that part of the problem? Where in other households in South Africa, the number is above 80% yeah. and there are no issues with education, discipline and the like. Yeah. Is that at the heart of our problem? That's definitely one of the <clears throat> main issues. Historically, uh, it has really affected, uh, you know, mixed homes, uh, blacks, colored Indians. It's really affected them quite so much because historically, uh, parents had to travel, especially the dad had to travel to another place to be able to get a job, to be able to get something to sustain the family. And you go to a big city and you face a whole lot of challenges and, and you don't, the kids are being raised in an environment where you don't really have that mentorship that you would really encourage you educationally yeah. and also socially so it's really become a, a huge problem and it's, it keeps going in a cycle uh, even that's I think that's the, that's the problem we have to say okay how do we talk about it uh, we've been talking about you know uh, women quite a lot how about we talk about the issues that men are going yeah. through yeah the, the, the problems that they become women's problems don't they Terence, from Nashville all the way here to South Africa mm. it's a story that really resonates through all throughout the the, th th throughout the nations of the world, but I think there's a particular thread between African Americans and mm. what we have here in South Africa. Right, we, we see, um, I've been here since 2009, back and forth, and I've seen so many similarities in, in communities of uh, African American communities and South African communities. So you see the same brokenness with fathers being absent. Uh, it, it seems to be the same cycle. The pain that you suffer as a young man, as a child, as a young boy, that you only reflect back in society later in life. You reflect back in society later in life, and most times you reflect it in a very negative way. You know, if, you're not, if you don't really take the time to process it, for someone to really help you to, to really deal with it. You know, you see a lot of men today who are married or who are adults, and they, they tend to abuse pornography or alcohol 
or they are abusive or very angry. For me, you have to go to the root of the problem. You have to go to their childhood. Yeah. And, and that's what we need to really concentrate, especially for women. Uh, you know, getting into a relationship or getting married to someone who is abusive, no, they're going to change and all that kind of stuff. But he's dealing with something that's been part of him for mm. a very long time. Terence, only one show, but we're going to bring it back. We need the show every day. <laughs> we would like to bring it back in the future, but we want to really uh, just get it kicked off here first. We've done two runs in the U.S. that were incredibly successful, and the turnout was amazing, and the, the they were very receptive, and so, I mean... We're starting off in South Africa, so. You've got a, you've got a, you've, you've got a quick, you've got a quick rap final comments in. Yeah. I understand we're going to get a, uh, give, we've just got to give away tickets. Why don't you tell us yes, about that? Yes, we, we have two tickets to give away. I don't know how you want to okay, give it away. Okay, so what we'll do is, I think it's, a, it's a, a poem <laughs> for broken boys. If you want to go see it on Sunday, one show only, uh, send us on our Twitter feed. Just send us a quick line. Why do you want to go to the show, and you'll be able to come and pick them up here in Johannesburg nice. uh, at the SABC reception. How about that? There you have two tickets. Thanks. Thanks, Solomon. Pleasure. Uh, are we now going to get a poem? Yes, we're going to get a poem uh, yeah? for, from uh, Terence. And don't okay, we're going to say goodbye, <laughs> and we're going to go out with a beautiful poem that Terence is going to do for us. Thank you. You're watching Newsroom. See you tomorrow. In an IDP camp in Gulu, she lays on her cot alone. Body weak and she is feeble, fear stealing her right to eat, age robbing her of ability to be. She allows her son to go to school, cities away to learn, because she knows that this is his only way to escape. Her baby won't be a soldier. And his concern is while I am here, she lies dying. While I eat, she lies in a government hut starving, and she is alone. And she is alone, and as she lays there, deep breaths she struggles to take. An overwhelming silence surrounds her, and in her pain comes a sound. I know that it feels hard. And it's so tough now. But if you would hold on, if you would hold on, change is coming.